Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Haitian American Museum of Chicago's program tonight, Bloodlines and Waterways, featuring a prestige panel of genealogists from the Haitian Genealogy Group. This is a topic the museum has been trying to explore for a while now, and we are super excited to host this amazing group of researchers. My name is Carlos Bossard, and I am the executive director of the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. It is great to see you all tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Hammock's mission is to preserve and promote Haitian art, history, culture, and community in Chicago and beyond. Education is at the core of our mission, and we are glad to continue to bring insightful, meaningful, and impactful lectures and programs to the community. This program is also a part of Hammock celebration of November 18th, which was yesterday. Um, as you all may know, on November 18th, 1803, the Battle of Vertier was fought, which was the last major battle of the Haitian Revolution. Additionally, on November 18th, 2012, the Haitian American Museum of Chicago opened its doors. Yes, that's right. We are now nine years and one day old. Well, both of these events are very important in Haitian history and the museum continues to celebrate them both each and every year. I am very proud to be sharing this space with all of you. Before we begin, I'd like to do some housekeeping and let you all know the format of tonight's event. First, this program is being recorded and if you do not wish to be seen, feel free to turn off your video cameras now. Also, all of you are automatically put on mute as you enter the room. Please remain on mute throughout the program to ensure everyone can hear the fantastic presentation. Auto-generated captioning has been turned on for accessibility purposes. If you do need that script, please feel free to reach out after the program. And after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session with the panel moderated by myself. Please submit any questions you have at any time during the presentation via the chat, and I'll make sure to get to all of them properly. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the Haitian Genealogy Group. The Haitian Genealogy Group is here to bridge the gap between the diaspora and those born and living in Haiti through the lens of genealogy. As a hub with access to research, education, resources, and collaboration, they enable people to create and preserve a record of their family history and lineages. Everyone, please welcome the Haitian Genealogy Group. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome, welcome. My name is Alan Edhart. I'm one of uh, the core researchers here with the Haitian Genealogy Group. I'm here with a great panel of expert genealogists who have been on this journey for quite some time. So if you guys look at this slide, we called it Bloodlines and Waterways. And this is a title that was created by Andre, one of our core researchers. And it really embodies who we are and what we're doing, because we are connecting and bridging the gap from all parts of the world to Haiti. So if you look at the first picture in the upper left-hand corner, that is my fourth grade grandfather. His name is Jean-Baptiste Charles Denegui, and he is from Lurkai in Haiti, and his ancestry is actually from France, and as well as he also might have some parts of German in him. We're working on it. On his father's marriage certificate, it says that they're from Martinique, so it's still a mystery. On the second picture is the ancestor of one of our core research researchers, Florence. His name is Pierre Emery Jones. He was actually a pastor from Philadelphia who was part of the African Episcopal Church and wed a Native American woman and actually moved to Haiti, and there is a large Jones family that is still present to this day who settled in St. Mark. And then the third picture on the bottom is Pierre Teoma Canal. He's also another one of mine and many ancestors. He was president of Haiti at some point. And this is a picture that I got from the family that kind of, from when he was younger. It's not a picture that people commonly see. I believe he was going to his daughter's wedding or something in that photo. So I wanna welcome you all and thank you so much for being here with us this evening. And now we're going to go ahead and start our presentation. So here is our team. This is the panel of genealogists that help everybody around the world focus on their Haitian genealogy. We do have a Facebook group, so make sure you please go and check it out. We also do have a website that has just launched, so make sure to check out HaitianGenealogy.com. In these pictures, you will see Steve Mendes, Mendes Florence Harrington, Jerry Joseph, Jordan Dubré, Kiki Toussaint, Andre Lamath, 
Didier Gills, Aletra, which is me in the middle, Christina Schutt. You also have Natasha Gaspard, Claudie Lavin, um, Peter Frisch, and Gerline Emmanuel. These are the people behind the scenes and front of the scenes who help us move forward and get things going. Some of us have certain expertise, whether it be Cap Haitien, Saint Mark, Jeremy, Port de Pay. Some of us have lineages from Italy, from Lebanon, from Germany, which you will hear in this presentation. So please be a lookout. If you guys go on the Facebook group, we were more than willing and able to help you guys along with your research. Now, what does it mean to be Haitian? Now, this is gonna be all Natasha. She is going to explain from her point of view, what she feels it means to be Haitian. Go ahead, Natasha. Merci, Peel, Alain. Thank you for having us. So I can't, this, this question, what does it mean to be Haitian is something that um, has come up a lot in a lot of our conversations. So we are the Haitian genealogy group and we have come together like Voltron for people who know what Voltron is. <laughs> it's like we have all of our superpowers have come together and built this team of Haitian researchers and genealogists and at the core of it we have a lot of conversations where we're grappling with identity right what does it mean to be Haitian um, you know a lot of the times when we're when we were speaking and getting to know each other we shared a lot of our um, our background and growing up as Haitian right some of us um, were born in Haiti on this team some of us have never been to Haiti, but have Haitian parents or Haitian grandparents. And, but at the, at the foundation of it, we have a love for this country and for its people. And I think that's what brings us um, to this work, right? That's what really fuels us. And so the question of what does it mean to be Haitian um, is a question, again, of identity. And doing Haitian genealogy, um, being involved in it, you know, tracing your family lineage, um, is definitely going to bring up a lot of, uh, is going to bring up that question to the forefront, right? No matter where you are in, in your journey. And so in the research that, that I've been doing personally, for me, um, questions of borders, right? And the notions of what, of what are borders and nationality and race have been challenged. Um, and so for us, we, we trust like we know that the journey that you will embark on with your family tree will have you asking this question as well, right? We talk about, you know, language, we talk about culture, we talk about, um, you know, like I said, nationality, what does it mean to be free? When we talk about IET, um, freedom is really at the forefront of what we're talking about. And so when we talk about these migration patterns in this um, upcoming presentation, you will see that there was a lot of challenges to this, to this notion of freedom. And so I wanted to kind of kick things off with really challenging us to listen with opening ear, open ears and open minds to this presentation, because you're gonna hear a lot of things that may not fit into your idea of what it means to be Haitian, right? Um, and so I think that this is one of the amazing benefits of doing Haitian genealogy because it challenges what you, or what you thought you knew. And so when we come to Haitian genealogy, we must really come to the realization that we are on a quest for truth, okay? And genealogy is not for the weak. That's what I like to say. <laughs> you have to know and be ready for whatever it is. And so with that said, um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the people in the group, right? Um, we have genealogists who have been doing this for 30 plus years, right? And then me, I'm, I'm, I'm me and there's another, uh, another woman in the group who are the newest genealogy professionals to join the group. We've been doing it for about two years. And so we run the gamut. We run the gamut with experience. We run the gamut with, um, with our stories and our passion is really unmatched. And so I just want you to sit back and enjoy this presentation because we're gonna, we have a lot, we have a lot to share with you. So I'm gonna kick it back to you, Ellen. All right, no problem. Thank you so very much, Natasha. Thank you so very much. All right, who are you? 
To forget one's ancestors is to be a brook without a source, a tree without a root. These are some pictures from our members of their family um, from back in Haiti. So this is just to show you the different, the melting pot of cultures that we do have. So before we do go on with the presentation, we're gonna introduce each one of us and give you a little fun fact and more info. So you guys can get to know us a little bit more. Also, please don't forget that we do have an open Q and A in the Zoom chat. So please poise any questions that you have in the chat. So at the end of the presentation, we can address these questions and give you guys some answers. So I will start off. My name is Ale and I live in Miami, Florida. I've been doing research since 1998. So that's gonna take me a little bit over 20 years. Um, a fun fact about me that people um, seem to be surprised about is that I love to cook, I love to bake and salsa dance. It's one of my passions. What surprised me the most about my genealogical research is the fact that I was unaware of the complexity of the different countries and nations that make up my DNA of who I am. I always thought, you know, my family's from Hansh or they're from St. Mark or they're from Jeremy, but it goes even deeper than that. We've been able, like with DNA, to pinpoint which West African countries we came from and which European nations were made of in all these different spots in the cities and it's phenomenal and genealogy is important to me because I feel that in order for us to know who we are we need to dig deeper and dig back we need to find out who we were in the 1800s if we came from another country why did we leave Martinique and Guadeloupe to go to Haiti what what was going on during that time. So that's why it's important to me. Now I'm gonna let it off to Andre. So Andre, please tell them, obviously your name, <laughs> where you live, how many years you've done it, fun fact, and just go ahead and introduce yourself to the great people who are watching us this evening. All right, cool. Thank you guys for having me. My name is, my name is Andre. Um, I live in the Tampa Bay region in Florida. I have been doing genealogical research since I was five. So that is over 20 years. And um, one of the things that surprised me in my research has similar to what Alan was talking about, um, finding connections in my ancestry, um, my Haitian ancestry to Mexico. And even though shocking, it was still shocking to me, uh, the Dominican Republic, um, and um, connections to South Carolina. That was very interesting. Those were very shocking uh, things to find during my, my research. And I love genealogy. It's really cool. Um, but one fun fact about me is I'm actually, um, I'm an elementary school teacher, um, early childhood educator. And I am the only um, pre-K teacher in my county who teaches in the public school setting. So fun fact about me. Awesome, thank you so very much. Next up, we have Jordan. Go ahead, Jordan. Thank you, hello everybody. My name is Jordan Dubrio. I'm from Michigan, I lived in Chicago and I'm currently in New York. Um, I started my journey, my genealogical journey, pretty young, about five, I'd say, to similar to Andre. Um, and then throughout the years and growing up, my grandparents being um, with me, I asked them questions, um, everything about Haiti, what it means to be Haitian, just things like that, um, just to learn the history and really uh, um, these things are important to me as family, you know. So, yeah, so the past four years, I've done a lot more serious research. Um, a lot of more materials are, have been accessible to us as researchers, um, specifically having ancestors from Haiti. So... That's what we're here to share and um, really showcase today as well. Um, and I guess a fun fact would be that I'm also a photographer. So that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much. Next up, go ahead, Natasha, take the floor. Okay, hey everybody, I'm back. Natasha Gaspard here, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, still living in Brooklyn. Um, I cannot remember the first time I created my family tree. I know it was years ago, but then I left it alone because I hit a brick wall. But then um, I started again in 2020, 20, end of 2019. And so a fun fact about me is that I'm going to give you two. Um, I am uh, an Emmy Award winning television producer. And number two is I am cousins with Jordan. <laughs> 
think we, we told the we told the audience. But we're we're cousins. Um, well, actually, I'm related to a lot of people on this group, but we'll get into that in the presentation. Um, why genealogy is important to me? I think that it is um, definitely a way for us to find ourselves. I'm always um, interested in our personal life journey, and I feel like there's no better way to know about yourself than really finding out who you are through your family line. Like, how did you get here, literally, right? And so I think that gene Haitian genealogy is the perfect way to do that. So that's me. Awesome, thank you so very much. Next up, we have one of our researchers who's been, who's been doing it more years than all of us. <laughs> Peter, go ahead, the floor is yours. Let me know your name, how long you've been doing it, what surprised about your research and why is it important to you and a fun fact. Thank you, Alain, and hello and good evening to everybody. My name is Peter Frisch, born and raised in Haiti and still living in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So I was uh, bitten by the bug of genealogy when I was 16, back in 1976. So 44 years ago. So I'm like the elder of the group. I'm the senior of the group. And uh, I've never stopped ever since. I consider genealogy like a therapy for me. It's, uh, it's my escape route and... Uh, Definitely so uh, grateful that I have been able to uh, do research in genealogy uh, back in the days when it was very hands-on, uh, before internet, before uh, the web, and that uh, you had to go into the archives and search the records, uh, going through the documents uh, page by page. It was an amazing experience. But uh, modern technology really opens so many new doors in so many ways and have uh, allowed me to uh, find uh, so many informations that I would have never been able to, uh, to get uh, on uh, my ancestors and family uh, in the past. So I'm uh, currently the manager of uh, Maison Ridé a 120-year-old publishing company in Haiti, specialized in uh, publishing school books and children literature, uh, but not limited to these two categories. So I have to say genealogy led me to, uh, to also have a passion for, uh, for Haitian history and world history. It has uh, enabled me to uh, meet relatives around the world and uh, develop very uh, lifelong uh, ties with so many people. I'd say also that uh, it brought me humility because you have to keep a very open mind when you're doing genealogy because you never know what you're gonna find. You're gonna, you never know what you're gonna get. And you must be willing to accept everything that uh, you do discover because who you are is a little bit of all these ancestors that came before you. And that humility comes from the fact that, you know, I'm a, I found myself a descendant of, a, of slaves and slavers and uh, descendants of a nobility as much as revolutionaries. So uh, I'm a true melting pot from all over the world. So that's about me. Thank you so very much, Peter. That was so great. Last but not least, we have one of our DNA gurus, <laughs> should I say, Steve Mendez. Go ahead, Steve. How you doing, everyone? Uh, my name is Steve Mendez. Um, I was born and raised in New York. I no longer live there, but I'll be in New York in my heart till the day I die. Um, I've been doing this for about 20 plus years. Um, off and on, you know, I feel like <clears throat> you go through periods of... Uh, greater research and, and times where you take a back seat. Um, but overall, 20 plus years. I want to give two fun facts, just like Natasha. Um, my first fun fact is that I share DNA and roots with about five people on the team that I know of so far. And then my second fun fact would be that my great grand uncle believed he was a descendant of Jean-Baptiste Point du Stab, and he wrote a couple of books about it. Um, what surprised me most about 
my genealogy was the difficulty you have on some lines finding records, but then also how some lines you can easily go back to 1804. You know, that's what's surprising. You know, you don't expect that in ge genealogy. You figure it's going to be one way or another, and it's just not. So be prepared for that. <laughs> and um, why I think genealogy is important is because it's your family history. And if you don't document it, who's going to do it? So that's me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I'm going to leave with one last uh, fun fact with the group. We've actually realized a lot of us are related and we didn't know we're related. Like there's a group of us, um, a group of them. I'm not part of that group yet. There's five or six individuals in our team who actually descend from a woman whose name is Ursul and she was an enslaved woman. In a, plan, uh, in a plantation in Quadribuque, and me and Steve are also related to DNA. I'm not related to Peter, but I'm related to his wife and other people, and we've found just, it's a melting pot in this web of, of matches, so it's pretty amazing. So we're going to continue with the presentation as well. Haiti is no different than any other country in the Western Hemisphere. Um, we're a melting pot of all different parts of the world, and throughout history, we've seen all these different nations migrating over to whether it was Haiti, Saint-Domingue, Haiti with the H-A-Y-T-I or H-A-I-T-I, doing the different names of what Haiti was, we have all these different connections. Also uh, through DNA, like I said before, we've actually been able to trace down which West African empires we were from. People have to understand also that during the slave trade, is that there were empires. So it was the Fulani, the Aizo, the Nago, the Fon, the countries that we know now weren't present. And we've done with Dane actually tracked it down. We've also seen large migrations from all of the other Caribbean countries, Curacao, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, Cuba, but also United States cities. We've realized now we have a lot of connections with people from Louisiana, Charleston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Quebec, and we'll go about that in the presentation, but it's just fascinating to see all the different connections that we have with all of these different places. A lot of people are under the assumption that Haiti is just the French colonizers and the enslaved people, but it's so much more deeper than that. It's more than knowing that your grandmother came from Jeremy and your grandfather came from Quadrupuque, but where did their great grandparents come from and fourth great grandparents come from? It's so much deeper. These are just some of the flags from some of the countries that we have seen connections to Syria, China, Cuba, Curacao, the United States, Jamaica, Martinique, Greece, Guadeloupe, Poland, Brazil. And these are just a few, but not all. We have actually seen national archives that we've researched. We have actually seen um, we've actually seen these countries listed as their citizens or subject of these areas. So now next up, I'm gonna Go ahead and hand it off to Steve. He's going to talk about his Italian connection. Thanks, Alan. So uh, before I get into the brief overview of Italian immigration, I just want to talk about some of the images and documents you see in this slide. Um, I'll start off in the center. Um, that home is known as the Cordasco family home. It's a well-known gingerbread style home in Paco, which is a suburb of Port-au-Prince. To my knowledge and family history, Giovanni Cardasco was the first owner of this house. Um, that snippet that you see, the record up there, is a record from 1893, um, and it's from Koto, which is in the southern department of Haiti. The father is listed as Joseph Larco, Italian subject. And if you look uh, further, you'll see that the mother is listed as Marie Robuste, a Haitian woman who also happens to be my second great grandmother. Last but not least, the men you see are Italians who were living in Haiti. The man on the right is my grandfather. Um, I've been told that him and his brother were always seen in either white or khaki suits. And as you can see in this photo, he's wearing a white suit. Um, my grandfather was one of the many Italians that immigrated to Haiti in the 1890s and early 1900s. For him specifically, that year was 1904. When researching this time frame, you can find passenger manifests for ships that list Italians stopping in New York, but then when you look at their final destination, it said Haiti. When I was younger, I always wondered why Italians had decided to immigrate to Haiti. Though it's hard to know the individual reasons why these families came over, when you look at the history of the time, 
you see that Southern Italy was suffering from poverty and <laughs> Southern Italians were leaving Italy in mass. Um, in large part, they were going to the US, but as we know, a small group decided Haiti was going to be their new home. The largest group of Italians coming to Haiti came from the Campania region, and the largest number of those families, including my grandfather's, came from a town called Teora. Some of the well-known names of those families are Cordasco, Martino, Patoya, Riccardi, Sperduto, and Vicello. These families became a large part of the business district in Haiti. My grandfather was a shoemaker. Others were involved in clothing, liquor, import, export, as well as uh, others, just to name a few. They came with nothing and in some cr cases created great wealth. Many of them became naturalized Haitian citizens, spent most of their lives there and still have descendants living in Haiti today. Um, if you're interested in more information about Italians living in Haiti, there's a great book written by Dr. Joseph Bernard Jr. He not only covers the families that I mentioned, but he also discusses families that came from other areas in Italy, as well as some of those that settled in Dominican Republic. Um, that's it for me. But during the Q&A portion, if you have any other specific questions about Italians in Haiti, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, so much. You actually taught me something I didn't know about the Italian migration to Haiti, so that is great. Next up, we have our, our friend, Peter Fritsch, who's gonna go ahead and talk about his German connection from Germany to Haiti. Go ahead, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alain. So uh, regarding uh, German migration to Haiti, uh, it started uh, in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, I mean, sorry, 19th century, and uh, went on and continued uh, all the way through the 1930s. Uh, so back in the beginning, you could not talk about Germany per se, because as a country, Germany uh, became uh, into being uh, in 1870. So prior to that, it was like a multitude of kingdoms and uh, city-states uh, and uh, duchies and uh, of the sorts. And uh, so uh, they came to Haiti. Most often, all those immigrants coming to Haiti came for a better livelihood. It was always due to some war, some famine, some uh, economic crisis in their homeland and looking for a uh, a better life, uh, some of these families end up uh, arriving to Haiti. And uh, also, uh, as a few family comes, they always attract other families from the same area. And in the end, you have uh, a big community. So uh, Haitians uh, up to this day have a lot of uh, descendants who are uh, in, living in Haiti who are uh, of uh, German ancestry. Uh, me personally being uh, one of them with the name Frisch, F-R-I-S-C-H. It's not the French spelling. And uh, on that picture there, it's uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my German grandfather, Karl Frisch, and uh, my father, the kid, who's Wilhelm Frisch, they were, uh, he was born in Jacmel, and uh, my grandfather was born in Lübeck, uh, Germany, the Anseatic uh, city of Lübeck. And uh, his wife was born in Jacmel. Uh, her name was uh, Germaine Beasley. And she was uh, part British, part uh, Martinique, part Guadeloupean, and part uh, Dutch. So right there already, you can see the nice uh, mixture of uh, origin. And uh, so uh, that German community became uh, over the years, very powerful, very uh, uh, an economic uh, strong uh, hold in Haiti, uh, involved in trade, in banking, and uh, also in uh, industry. And uh, they kept on growing uh, and becoming a sizable community up to World War II, when uh, uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. 
Haiti at the time, uh, following uh, the United States declaring war to the Axis. Uh, also, Haiti declared war uh, to Japan, to Germany, and to Italy. And uh, the president of the time uh, in Haiti, Elie Lesco, uh, decided to seize all the belongings and the businesses of the Germans living in Haiti and uh, expelled uh, the Germans uh, from the country. And uh, after the war, uh, a lot of them never came back, but a few did. And uh, you do have uh, families still in Haiti uh, carrying uh, German names. You have uh, Schutt, you have uh, Schmidt, uh, Helmke, Lemke, Hirsch, uh, Frisch, Siegel, Berman. All of these are uh, German uh, family names that are still uh, present in Haiti and involved in the, uh, in the community. So that's uh, about what I would have to say about uh, the coming of the Germans in Haiti. And uh, they were very, very strong and numerous at uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century and in many, many cities uh, around uh, Haiti. So that's Thank what I Thank you so very much, Peter, so very much. Man, he has so much knowledge, it's insane. So I appreciate that so much. And if you guys see in the first section of the slide, the record's actually from the Vermont family. This is from, I believe, one of the marriage records that we zoomed in so you guys can see that they're natives from Hamburg, Germany. So it's fascinating. Thank you once again, Peter. You're very welcome. So Lebanon, these, this is, these are my people. My second great grandfather came from Miziara, Lebanon migrated to Dominican Republic and from there had children in Haiti, multiple children, and that's where the family started from. The gentleman um, with the glasses is actually my great grandfather and next to him is his father who was from Lebanon. So for those who don't know, there was a large Lebanese migration all over the world, but including the West Indies. For about 402 years, um, the Ottoman Empire ruled over Lebanon right up until like 1918. And in the 1800s, there was a large exodus. They were persecuted because they were Maronite Catholics. It was, if I talked to the cousins in Lebanon and they say it was literally like the Holocaust of Germany, it was the Holocaust of Lebanon from what they went through. And I always thought I would never be able to track down my family, find the information. My family's last name from Lebanon was Taktuk, T-A-C-T-U-C-K. In Dominican Republic, it's T-A-C-T-U-K. But in Haiti, when my great-grandfather was born, the father was not present. And from what I understand, the stories told by law, the, he could not, the mother could not legally give him the father's last name. So his name was Elias Taktuk. So he got Elias as the last name. Now our surname is Elias. And every generation it's changed. I've actually been able to trace this family lineage back recently to my fourth great grandfather who was from Bishari, as well as family from Beirut and Zagartha in Lebanon with DNA testing. And the gentleman on the bottom of the photos, those are actually my second great grand uncles who are actually one is still alive at 94 years old, as well as my great grand aunt, who was the daughter of my second great grandfather who just turned 93. So it is beyond fascinating to find these connections and find out of you know, where my people are from. So once again, any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We are here for you guys to help you all out. Now, Jordan, my man, you are up next. Speak about your connection with Guadalupe. Thank you, thank you. Um, as Anna said, um, my connection to Guadalupe is through our, or through my ancestor and Natasha's George Gauthier. Um, to begin, the middle photo is my grandmother. Um, and in the bottom right, that's George Lioto, who's also a descendant of um, this ancestor. So Guadeloupe is a country in the French Caribbean, for those who don't know, in the Lesser Antilles. Um, and many people migrated to and from Haiti um, for the past centuries. Um, and while my research took me here, I was researching my grandma's lineage um, on her paternal side, bearing the name Kanta from Guadeloupe. Um, and for my grandma, she was like, all lineages were 
in Kwadi Bouquet, to my knowledge, and a lot of my res my research at the time. Um, her father's name was Armand Kantav. He was mayor of Kwadi Bouquet. And after further researching him for years, um, about two years ago, I was able to find his birth, his birth record for the first time. Um, and then later on, I was able to find his father's birth record, whose name was Elio Kantav, which stated his parents' names, Mentor Kantav and Ali Net Gauthier. Um, and at this point in my research, I had never come across Gauthier, seen it um, in many records. So I kept researching the surname further. Um, I recognize it was a French last name, but it didn't seem to be very common within Haiti um, after reaching out just to different people in general research. So I kept looking into it and seeing if I could find any living descendants with that name today. Um, one I discovered through DNA testing and then others I found just through other ways of contact. Um, but to figure out my, my family's connection um, to Gauthier, I contacted some of my grandma's living uh, uh, first and second or first and second cousins um, who ended up remembering the name and confirming the name of Inet Gauthier. And it was passed down that the name came from our ancestor, Georges Gauthier, coming from Guadeloupe. So from there, I continued to dive in more to see if I can figure out anything um, in my research. So I became, I began coming across uh, many other records with his name um, in the Etat des Civils records, they call it, that we use, um, along with this book pictured here. Um, there's a there's two books actually, the Une Nuit en and then another one, Rogue Revolutionaries, The Fight for Le Legitimacy in the Great Caribbean, by Vanessa Mange. Um, and this book mentioned how Georges Gauthier, um, his father, Georges Gauthier, was mixed race and part of a group of individuals of African descent who were exiled in 1802 when Napoleon decided to deport nearly a thousand of Afro-Caribbean soldiers and officers. Um, and from there, the native Guadalupians um, escaped to many neighboring islands, including Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, St. Bart's, Cuba, and Haiti. Um, and after that, my ancestor was a part of a group of collaborators who were Afro-Caribbean revolutionaries participating in the Boricua expedition. Um, and what they were documented doing was traveling to places like New York even um, to overthrow the Spanish rule in Puerto Rico at the time and establish the Republic of Boricua. So after that journey, uh, my ancestor, George Gauthier, ended up in Haiti after establishing his lineage there, um, along with the other collaborators listed on this page. Um, Saint Rose, Beignet, Dubois, and Jeanette Audin, um, settling in Haiti and other Caribbean islands. So, kind of illustrates just at different parts of your lineage, um, where some even other like the the neighboring Caribbean islands people really mi cross migrated pretty easily during those times, um, whether that was for personal or economic um, business reasons. In his case, he had to flee. So that is my connection to Guadeloupe through um, Haiti. Again, like everybody on site, if you have any questions um, about Quare Bouquet, I've done a lot of research there along with other people in the group. My grandpa's from Leogan, so I've done a lot of research there. Um, so if anybody has questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jordan, man. We're just full of information. <clears throat> We're just full of information and I love it, it's amazing. So just so you guys are aware who's watching, um, Haiti has stronger ties to the United States than most know. We have a multitude of records that have been located in multiple cities. We recently found documents in Charleston, South Carolina. There are documents in Philadelphia as well as New Orleans with people who fled Haiti during the slave revolts. They fled Saint-Domingue, I apologize, during the slave revolts. And they seek they soak this they seek the asylum <laughs> in different cities in the US. So we've listed some of them here: Savannah, Georgia, St. John's, Florida, Baltimore, Maryland, New Orleans, Louisiana, Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm located right now doing this presentation, as well as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this picture is of a statue that was put up in Savannah, Georgia, based on a battle that was fought, and they actually brought soldiers 
and men from Saint Domingue to fight in the war that helped them win against the British. It's just a little bit of history that people aren't aware of. Um, in 1791 is when the slave revolts started, and in 1804 is when we gained our independence. But there is a large, a large, a large influx of connections. And how do we find it out? Through DNA. Through DNA testing, we have found out all of these connections to different cities, different countries, different nations, places we didn't know we had connections to. I have matches. I'm, I match people's grandparents and great grandparents, and I don't know how yet, but we are working out, you know, to figure it out, out what's there. This is this is a gentleman. His last name is Vio. This is a little bit about Philadelphia. This is uh, the Vio family that started from France. They went to Saint Domingue. They left Saint Domingue. They went to Philadelphia, and they returned back to Haiti, which is fantastic. This record is actually, if I recall, my Zoom is. This record um, lists Jean Baptiste Vio. He was the colonel of the first artillery regiment. And this is a record of um, his marriage when he was there in Haiti. So the, what this family did is that we've researched this family for years. They settled in Leogan. From Leogan, they fled because a slave revolt was happening. They were from France. And they went to Philadelphia. They had um, eight children. Seven of the children were actually baptized in Philadelphia. And then from there, they actually ended up coming back to Haiti because we found a record of a son or a daughter who was actually born in Haiti. So on the left-hand side, this is actually the American Catholic Historical Society of Philadelphia. This is the volume from 1806 to 1823 of the Holy Trinity Parish Church. And in the slide above on the right, it lists Louis Francis Benjamin Vio, but they do spell it with an X. This happens a lot in Haitian research. You're going to have to figure out the 16 spellings of one last name. There is no one way to spell it. This is the way the cookie crumbles. There's no way to beat it. You have to have 18 spellings of the name. We all go through this, which is hilarious. And on the bottom of this right here, these are the ones that are underlined. Those are the records of the kids being baptized. So these children, Victoria Anastasia Vio, Maria Ludovica Vio, we actually found their death record and marriage records in Haiti. So these children were baptized in Philadelphia. They lived in Philadelphia. And from there, they ended up back in Haiti, getting married, having children, and many of these families are still present today. They now live in the United States and Europe and all over, but they're definitely all still there. So it's just to show you the fascination of digging into your research. So me and my cousin Florence, who's also part of the group, we tried looking for the children's birth records and we couldn't find anything. I said, you know what, let's dig deeper. We started digging on Ancestry, on Family Search, different sites. And what did we found? All of the children listed being baptized in Philadelphia. So now that made our search dig even deeper. And they have parish records and church records. And a great woman from a group actually went to the church and she dug up the records for us and sent us copies of these records. So it was beyond, you know, amazing. It was, it was truly something. So now we have Andre. He's going to talk about New Orleans. Go ahead, Andre. The stage is yours. Uh, I don't have New Orleans. I apologize about that. Good. Sorry about, sorry about that, guys. So we'll talk about New Orleans. This is a family, the St. Maxette family, who originated from France, went to New Orleans, and ended up in Haiti. So on the left-hand side, this is actually, this is a portion of a book that was published about the family's genealogy. So in many places like France, Spain, Germany, as well as New Orleans, Charleston, Baltimore, you're going to find that families had to publish uh, they publish the genealogy and the information. Or even in the family Bible, they put the mother, the son, the daughter, who they married, who they had kids with. And this was, you know, the way, the way that it worked. There is uh, this on the right-hand side. It talks about uh, Plassage. In the 18th and 19th century Louisiana, the custom among many white men of setting up a Black or mixed-race woman in her own household, in addition to or in place of a wife. 
In Haiti, the relationship is similar to a marriage, but without a religious sanction and conferring fewer legal rights upon the female partner, often polygamous and short-lived. This is something that it definitely, you know, happens often in a lot of West Indian countries, as well as United States, all over the world. Two people get together, they have children, but they essentially don't go to the church or go to the priest to go and uh, and get wed. But it, it's interesting because of this connection that we have to New Orleans. This is actually um the Church of St. Louis. And this is an extract of his baptism. His name was Iluam Accent. And you see by the information, he was 32 years old. He was into craft and trade. He was a quadroon, which means he was a quarter black. Um, he was a free person at his birth, place of origin, Afro-Creole, New Orleans. And this is actually registered in the church's directory that he was born and baptized there. Now, this gentleman, his, I believe his son is the one who actually migrated to Haiti. And there is a large branch of family in St. Mark who extends from this family's lineage. So it's very possible that your grandmother, your great grandmother, or one of her siblings might have migrated to Haiti. Don't forget that we get our independence in 1804. We were the first independent, free black nation. So anybody else that was in the States and still dealing with slavery and hard times, whatever the case may be, they fled and they came to Haiti because the minute you touched the land, you were completely free which is something so beautiful. Now, next up, we have Peter talking about our, our connection. Mine and Peter has, have the same connection. It started in England. It went to Baltimore, Maryland, and it ended up in Lurkai, Haiti. So go ahead, Peter. The stage is yours. Peter, you muted. Okay, oh, do Okay. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Sorry about the technical problem. So, uh, yes, uh, regarding that connection of Baltimore and Lekai in Haiti, it's uh, we're talking of the Hal family. I'm not a direct descendant of the Hal family, but uh, my wife is, and therefore my children are descendants of the Hal family. And uh, the first one to be born in, uh, in Haiti and therefore Lekai was Edouard Hall. And uh, he was born uh, at the very end of the, uh, of the 18th century, at the end of the uh, colonial time of Saint-Domingue. And uh, the family uh, always knew that, you know, he was born of, uh, an, of an American uh, father. Who, uh, who was uh, in Lekai at the time. Uh, Edouard Hall himself, uh, after the independence, uh, played a political role. Uh, he even became a senator of, uh, of Haiti and uh, was very active, a uh, very active politician and uh, had a dire end because uh, he was executed in Lekai by order of Emperor uh, Faustin Premier. Uh, following that, uh, he, uh, his wife prohibited his, uh, their children to ever be involved in politics anymore. So, uh, but they did uh, many generations served as public servants, as a notary, as a director of customs in uh, the city of Lekai. Uh, many were uh, also merchants. It was a very prolific family. The, uh, Edouard Hall had many children, and each of these children had many children themselves. The, uh, the Hall girls uh, married into many other uh, Lekai families. And nowadays, you have a lot, a lot of Haitians living in Haiti and living in the States and overseas that, uh, that are descendants of the Hal family. Uh, what I would like to add at this point, uh, very often nowadays we think that uh, Haitian migration uh, to other parts of the world and to the United States uh, specifically is something recent. 
is something that started in the 1960s or 70s and even uh, more recently. Uh, it's not the case. Uh, Haitians, uh, that back and forth between uh, the United States and uh, Haiti has been going on uh, starting in colonial time, uh, went on in uh, the entire 19th century and now in the 20th century. So that connection and tie is very present and records prove it. I, uh, so that's what I had to say about it. Uh, the agreement between Alain and I was to uh, leave to Alain the presentation of the Baltimore connection, because I must say, uh, he is the one who gave me the link and that I was able to go further up that lineage uh, through Baltimore into England. Thank you so, so very much, Peter. Yeah, guys, so when Peter started the research, it's his wife's family, who's also my cousin, so his kids are my cousin as well. And we always thought, I think he was from somewhere else, and I started digging and digging and doing some research. So the two gentlemen that are pictured here, they're actually the great, great grandsons of Edward Hall, who was a trade merchant from Baltimore, Maryland. His name was spelled Edward, E-D-W-A-R-D, and his son, of course, spelled the French way, E-D-O-U-A-R-D. And that's how we found the connection along with DNA and the paper trail. We actually have a copy of Edward Hall from Baltimore, his will, his, his will and last testament, as well as ledgers and accounts from when he traveled as a trade merchant from Baltimore to Lekai. We also have records of his children's marriage documents or when he was actually in Haiti doing trade and we have those signatures. We actually matched up the signatures with somebody who works with handwriting to make sure it was the exact same signature as well as records and DNA. So it is amazing. The house on the right hand side is called Sophia's Dairy. D-A-I-R-Y. It is still located in Baltimore, Maryland. It is still standing today. And Edward Hall, the man from England who went to Haiti, actually it was his grandfather, Akilah Hall, who actually built this house for his for his um for his wife. It's actually on the Baltimore's National Historic Sites. You can go and visit the house and take a look, and the house is still standing. His family is also a part with signing the original Maryland Constitution. So there's a lot of info and ancestry that connects to there. I didn't dig into Haiti because Peter already did the work for me. I'm gonna share one more piece of information, which I thought was fascinating. This gentleman is Thomas White. He was a lawyer, surveyor, and a founder of the Academy and College of Philadelphia, which is the University of Philadelphia that is today. He is, the gentleman that I just showed you before, he is their second, no, he is their third great grandfather. He is Colonel Thomas White. And if you go to the University of Philadelphia, his photo is there, along with information about his past, who he wed, who his children are. And this is a direct ancestor of people who are descendants of the Hall family from Leka IIT. So this is just to show you, the digger you deep, the more you find the connections are there. You never know where you may be because some people don't believe that there's anything outside of Haiti, but there's so much more. <laughs> there is so much more. Next up, now this is Andre's slide. So we have Andre, he's gonna be talking about his first cousin, three times removed, Charles Benjamin Visa. Go ahead, Andre, it's all yours. All right, so this is my first cousin, Charles Benjamin Vesson. Um, He was born in Gonaive around, um, in 1881. And he left Haiti in 1904 for the United States. And um, he actually settled in Chicago as early as 1911. And um, I actually found him living in uh, on Way Wabash Avenue and Vincennes Avenue. Those, so those are places that are still in Chicago. Um, so he, he was living there around um, 1915 when he became a naturalized citizen. So um, he really became part of the, the African-American community in Chicago. Um, in 1919, he married an African-American woman named Myra Fitz Butler. She was a, a school teacher and she was actually the daughter of Louisville, Kentucky's first black 
doctors, doctors Henry and Sarah Fitz Butler. And um, he was living in Chicago for years and, um, I, and he was a businessman. And the article that you see on the right side of the screen is, um, it was an article featuring him because his brother became president of Haiti, um, Stanio Vincent in the 1930s. So um, this article was actually um, published in the Chicago Defender, which was a, a, a black American newspaper. And so during his brother's presidency, he um, actually became a diplomat and he um, was a council general of Haiti. And so he was traveling um, back and forth between Haiti and New York where he um, had resided in his, uh, where his office was stationed. And um, that is actually where he died in 1945. Um, and the picture on the right is actually part of a larger photograph of uh, a luncheon in New York with other diplomats from uh, um, other different countries. So, um, so yeah, well, there's a little little connection between uh, Haiti and Chicago and my family. That's it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so very much, Andre. But you're not done quite yet. <laughs> He's gonna, <laughs> right now, this is another one for Andre, St. John's, Florida. So Andre's gonna give us a little more info on the connection from St. John's, Florida to Haiti. Go ahead, Andre. All right, so in this, um, this photograph of a statue of a woman, her name was Anna Madgejean Jai Kingsley. And she was actually a Wolof um, who had been enslaved, captured and enslaved at age 13. And she was sold in Cuba. Um, and she was purchased by a white man named Zephaniah Kingsley. Zephaniah Kingsley actually had property in St. John's, Florida, where he took Anna and brought her there. She became um, the mother of four of his children, um, freed by him. And he actually made her um, manager of his plantation. So she was essentially a slave owner as well. So in the 1830s, their property was becoming threatened due to um, wars with Spanish Florida and, and all that. So to preserve their wealth, they actually, um, Zephaniah Kingsley um, had the idea of relocating to Haiti. So this was during the time that Haiti was governing the entire island. So Zephaniah Kingsley, he has his personal meeting with um, President um, Boyer and he's asking permission to relocate to Haiti. And the president says, yes, but um, Haiti doesn't have, um, there's no slavery. Slavery has been outlawed. So all of the, the slaves that uh, Kingsley had on his plantation, they couldn't come to Haiti and be slaves. And also Haiti at the time had a law that said no white people could own land in Haiti. So Zephaniah Kingsley decided to put uh, the title and deed of property in Haiti in his son's name that he had with Anna and um, decided to free his slaves. So he brought to Haiti, which at the, at the time, like I said, is the, Haiti was governing the entire island, but it's the location where the Kingsleys uh, relocated is in modern day um, Puerto Plata in Dominican Republic. So he brought with him over 100 formerly enslaved people, some of which were from Africa, some of which had been born in Florida and brought them to the island along with Anna and their son. So you have this really interesting connection between Haiti, Florida, and the Dominican Republic because the descendants of those formerly enslaved people, a lot of them stayed and their descendants are on the island. And not only that, but the descendants of Anna and her, they weren't married, but her um, lover, husband, uh, Zephaniah Kingsley, um, the they're, they're, they're descendants of their youngest son stayed in, on the island as well. And in fact, my father is a DNA match to one of her descendants. We don't share, I don't share ancestry with um, on this line in particular, but um, like I said, it's just a really interesting connection between Haiti, Dominican Republic and Florida. 
That's it. Thank you so very much, Andre. My mute button does not want to work. <laughs> on the on the right hand side, these are photos of the actual um, Kingsley Plantation in St. John's, Florida. So the connections go far and wide. And Andre, <laughs> we just have him talking up a storm the next like three slides. He is going to speak about now about um, the South uh, the South Carolina you know, connection, and then we're going to dig into DNA and then open up for Q&A. So go ahead, Andre. You're not done speaking just yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I descend from several uh, white slave-owning families in Saint-Domingue, uh, the Bala and Gajan. And um, these, I have found members of these families that left Saint-Domingue, and they went to South Carolina, where there was a really large population of exiles, these refugees that were taking um, refuge in South Carolina. So one of these, these family members, these relatives, um, was my fifth great grandfather, uh, Pierre Beton Gajan, which you see on the right, he's featured in an article that was put out in Charleston, South Carolina in 1803. And he's, he's basically offering his services to the community there. Um, these these people that came to uh, South Carolina, they were not only coming to preserve their own lives, but they were also bringing with them enslaved people from San Domingue with them. And they were coming to South Carolina, a lot of them, and continuing the practice of slavery and profiting off of slavery. And so while they left San Domingue, they were still having, um, they had, they had ties to the property that was there and they lost their property in the revolution. And um, a lot of these people received the indemnity monies um, because of their lost property that France uh, was hustling and pressuring Haiti to pay, which is uh, still a very controversial topic. Um, but on the left, um, you see an excerpt from another fifth great uncle, um, Theodore Galjean, who actually mentions in his will that he's bequeathing to his living relatives in South Carolina um, the monies that he receives from the indemnity. So you have in this example um, how generational wealth was created from uh, the indemnity money to white people in the United States and were receiving and building, continuing to build their wealth off of that. So um, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting story and it just happens to be relatives I found in my research. It's very interesting. We can go to the next slide. And um, this is a, another branch of the family, the Balan. So my sixth great aunt, um, Elizabeth Charlotte, Charlotte uh, Balan, she had left Saint-Domingue and this is actually uh, a bill of sale for a slave. And um, it says on here that it's a, a Negro boy named Casimir, and um, she is selling him for $300. And she's selling him in Charleston, South Carolina. So she was born in Mirbalé in Saint-Domingue, had come over in around 1795, 1796, uh, shortly after her husband was murdered in the insurrection. And so she brought with her, um, I know she brought in with her to South Carolina, a female slave. I don't know her name, but this child, this boy, Casimir was likely born on the island or, um, and or the, the son of this woman that I know she brought with her. And so you see, see her in this, this act, this, this record of um, selling, selling him. And for $300, just to give context about what that would be like in today's US dollars, that would be over $7,000 today. And, um, oh, as a side note, the, the monies that Theodore Galjean had received in 1831 when the indemnity report was done, it was around 14,000 uh, francs. Not sure how much that is in US dollars, but at the time it was $14,000 francs that he was bequeathing to his relatives. And on this next page, the slide, um, this is the continuation of the bill of sale for Casimir. So um, the thing that I wanted to, that we have highlighted here, it says that um, I guarantee, um, I'm trying to see what make out it says, I guarantee the above mentioned Negro boy Casimir um, to be free from any encumbrance 
And so what that meant was this, this boy who wasn't, was probably younger than 12, you know, he had to have been checked out, examined, and found to be physically fit to be sold and so that Balan could receive the monies from his sale. So you have, like I said in this example, the practice, the continuation of the practice of slavery from the, those who are escaping Saint-Domingue and coming into the United States. So that's my part. Thank you so much, Andre. Man, like that information. When I see these kind of documents, it kind of like gets me it more interested because it's literally a bill of sale for an ancestor that you had. We think while we do research, we can't find these things that we can't find manumission documents, that we can't find bill of sales, or we can't find what plantation our families come from. But this is to show you guys that We've done the work and it's possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. But well, it's possible. So this is just a quick little slide. Um, this shows you the outlines of the different empires that were there. So if you guys notice in the West African area, you're gonna see Nigeria, Benin, you're gonna see all those countries. And you see the Ashanti and the Yoruba. You're going to notice that the Yoruba encompasses two modern day countries. The Ashanti encompasses three modern day countries. So this goes to show you that when you're looking at DNA results or looking for information, you can't just base it, oh, I'm 2% Ethiopian. Yes, but how far back? You know, I'm 3% from Mauritania. I'm 6% from Benin, 26% from Congo. But you have to focus on the African empires that were there during the time, which people we're taking over that land. And it's something that we've been helping people do with the help of our research team, our African-American cousins, as well as other genealogists. We've been trying to break down those walls and dig as deep as we can into genealogy and research and DNA and the context to figure out more about who we are and where we are from. Um, I would love for Steve to go ahead and um, give a little bit just about um, the DNA um, as part, Steve, Andre, and Jordan, are, and Jerry as well, are so well-versed <laughs> into DNA and Andre. Like, these men really know their thing when it comes to DNA and center Morgans. We're not going to bore you guys with too much scientific data, but I would just love to hear Steve's point on, like, the positivity of DNA and all of that aspect. So go ahead, Steve. Absolutely. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I love DNA for Haitian genealogy. Um, as we mentioned previously, there's times where records are there and there's times where records aren't. And when the records aren't there, DNA is gonna be your best friend in trying to find some relatives or some kind of um, connection. So I DNA tested and that's how I found that I connect to people here uh, in this group. You know, large matches, small matches. Uh, sometimes the connections are distant, sometimes they are more close. Um, a lot of people have reservations about DNA, but when you're doing your genealogy, it's a great tool. Um, you can use the connections that you find um, to help you further your tree. You may find a connection to somebody that's done more research than you have, and they can help you take your um, research even further. Um, you also find out, I know some people have asked about um, our African ancestry. Um, when you do these tests, uh, we do have um, people from the continent and, you know, Africans abroad who are taking DNA tests as well. And it helps for us to identify where some of our um, more distant relatives come from. So prior to the slave, you can say, oh, well, I have a 100% DNA match. For instance, my father um, has a 100% DNA match from Togo. My wife has a 100% Nigerian match um, in her DNA. So Am I 100% sure of the connection? No, but what we can say for certain is that we share an ancestor and more, li more than likely that ancestor comes from where, these, where they come from. So it's, in my opinion, it's a valuable tool. Fantastic, thank you so much. Before we go ahead and go to our Q&A, Andre, do you have anything you would like to share about DNA? I know that you're, you're a wizard when it comes to things of this sort. 
I'm going to say a wizard because I know nothing compared to you, Steve, and Jordan, the rest of you guys. It's really fascinating the way you dig deep. And just so you guys know, Andre really digs deep. And he's like, my father's part of this happier group. And I tracked this down and found this cousin from Nigeria. Like, he digs deep. So I just, you know, you don't have to share too much. or just give them a little bit of, you know, what you do. And then we're going to open it up and lead back to Carlos for the Q&A for our audience. We can answer some great questions. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, um, just real quick, the really amazing thing about DNA, I have to say, is to find, like, <laughs> your DNA, you can do DNA work, and you can find exact segments in your DNA that you have after doing genealogical research mm -hmm. and identify, oh, this part of my DNA comes from this ancestor. Oh, it comes from this ancestor. And so you are, you are doing this work, and you find, like, Oh, these people, they're not just names on a piece of paper. Oh, they're, and they may not just be like a face in a picture, but like they're in you and you are carrying them and they are alive inside of you. So DNA is one of the, it's a very amazing aspect of this research. And when you do it, like, like, like I said, it's just amazing to see like, oh, like this is where I come from. And like this, this person who was alive hundreds of years ago, like that's, the, I carry them inside of me and you get to see it in exactly in your DNA. So that part is amazing, yeah. That is so awesome, so awesome. Natasha, 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 would you have any last words? Yes, I had a lot of words, since we're short, since we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> this I'll is not gonna be the last one, this won't be the last one, but go ahead, okay. I'll let you do that and then we're gonna lead it off to Carlos right after, all right? Sure. Since we are on the topic of DNA, I just want to shout out my cousin, Michael, who is um, joining us all the way from the UK. And I found out about him through my DNA matches. We match and his family has, uh, his family is from Ghana. And so when I, the first time I went to Africa was in Ghana. I did not even know that I had ancestry in Ghana. So clearly the ancestors were in the mix. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I hit him up on ancestry and I said, we match. I want to, I want to find out how. And so we had a zoom call and it was just a pleasure. He's in his early twenties. It's, 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 it's such a pleasure to meet someone like, you know, Andre said that has your DNA that I never met before. didn't know we were ever related don't even know how I would even come up with that idea we don't understand right now it's a little too early in our research yet to find out how we actually connect but that is definitely going to be um you know our journey so I have IET and Ghana and how that connected we're still working on that so I just wanted to share um you know that story with people who might think that it's, it's difficult and, and impossible it's not every day. Every day, there's something new that's that's connecting us. So I just wanted to share that story. Awesome! Thank you, thank you, thank you all so very much for all of your assistance. I'm gonna give it all back to Carlos. We want to thank the Haitian American Museum of Chicago for allowing us to showcase this presentation and to show you guys, you know, what we do, what we know. So we love it. We thank you. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, no, thank you all so much for being here tonight. And before I start the Q&A, you know, because we're on the uh, topic of DNA, um, I think you all have inspired me a little bit because I'm adopted and I don't know anyone who shares any DNA with me. Um, and so I've always been a little skeptical, you know, about, you know, finding lineages, you know, finding someone. But as Natasha was sharing her experience, you know, I'm hoping for one day to have that that same feeling, you know, to actually find someone that I share, you know, my blood, my DNA with. So um, on a personal, very inspiring. And, and I really, truly appreciate everything you all have been able to share tonight. Um, we do have some questions uh, that have come through from the chat. Um, I'm gonna uh, kind of go to the beginning of some of the questions and we'll, and we'll make our way. Um, so one of our guests would like to hear a little bit more about African ancestry. Um, we're most Haitian, where are most Haitians ancestors from? And is there more research on African heritage? And I'll go ahead and I'll give an answer to that. So we have seen, from my memory, because I don't have it in front of me, most of our, our ancestors are from Benin and Togo, Nigeria, Congo, um, mostly the West African countries, but the largest percentages that we've seen is 
Benin and Togo and um, and Nigeria. Um, there is some research being done. It's something that we have recently been taking up and to dig more research. We have um, noticed many multiple connections. I myself have DNA match cousins in Benin. And it's actually, I'm related to like a royal family, the Deca family and a lot of Benin. And we talk every other day. I've spoken to the queen. So they are very excited to start building the gap and figuring out the research. If they do want more assistance in that, I would definitely say to go to our, um, our website, HaitianGenealogy.com, or find us on the Facebook chat. There's a few people who have expertise in that specific area. It hasn't been easy, but we are working towards that. But we have seen those are the major countries where we're from, but there's also people who have part Ethiopian, part Mauritania, um, part Southern Africa, and part maybe like the northern part of Africa. So it's really just a very broad spectrum of where we're all from. No, thank you very much. Uh, another question that we have from the chat um, is how does researching Haitian genealogy compare to doing researching into other groups? Is it more challenging than let's say doing research on Italian or Irish genealogy? I can, I can answer a bit. I, uh, let me see if I'm still on. Yeah, You're still I'm, on, Peter. Yes, because sometimes the, it disappears. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, uh, Haitian records uh, have suffered uh, through uh, the years of uh, the political turmoil and uh, the fires uh, in uh, various cities and hurricanes. And, uh, and therefore, we do have gaps in records. Uh, however, uh, we do have way more than people tend to believe. We do have a lot, a lot of uh, records, of uh, civil records. And uh, also it can be completed by uh, church records as well, because you have uh, the Catholic Church and uh, the different uh, Protestant denominations that have kept records as well. Uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, uh, the, the Mormons have uh, gone over uh, uh, digitizing, you know, all those records uh, from the National Haitian Archives. And uh, those uh, records uh, can be uh, looked at uh, over the, uh, their site, you know, in family search. However, for those who are living... Uh, in the States, for instance, uh, and who are only English speaking, uh, they would have to go through those records that are written in French. And also they are in handwriting. So you are, it sometimes can be challenging to, uh, to make up uh, certain words, especially when it comes to, the, to first names or family names. Uh, it's not always easy to read them. But uh, with uh, the help of other uh, genealogists that are more savvy, that have acquired experience, uh, you can get the help of, uh, uh, to help you read those records that you are finding. And uh, also, uh, it comes with training. At first, it can be very challenging, but as you go through the process, and it is a process, you will... Uh, end up learning more and more about reading those records. And usually uh, the structure, the frame of those records are pretty much uh, similar, the same. So you cannot, you may not make up all the wording and all the legal wording of the, the record, the birth, marriage and death records, but uh, you will pinpoint the names. And if you know those uh, keywords like, uh, uh, how you say in French, uh, son or daughter or husband or wife, father, mother, automatically you will be able to make up what's written on the record. No, fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, another question, and this is uh, specific to one of the slides that were up. Um, why were they coming to Baltimore and where was the house that was spoken about on those slides located in Baltimore? 
That is a great question. So this ancestor was a trade merchant. He left Baltimore and he was doing trade in Lekai. Um, a lot of trade merchants, pastors, bishops, businessmen, textiles, and people were trading furs and different treasures were trading with St. Domingue. It was a very rich and prosperous, very prosperous French colony. So these trade merchants were going to Haiti to do trade. And a lot of them had partners or plasage and they had children that they didn't claim. <laughs> so these children ended up being the descendants of these, of these trade merchants. And the house is located, I can't remember exactly where it is located, but if you look for Sophia's Dairy, it's going to be spelled the normal way, S-O-P-H-I-A, and then D-A-I-R-Y. It's actually in Riverside, Maryland. It's, um, it's, in River it's in Riverside, Maryland. So look for that. And that is the house of that ancestor. And it is there on the National Registry. But it's, it happens a lot. I have many lineages as well that are from Boston, that are from um, New York, that are from Philly and, I, and another place. And they were all trade merchants. They were priests. And they came down to begin the Methodist Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or they were starting the Pentecostal Church, and they were very influential in the uprising of many um, denominations in Haiti. Uh, may I add also that uh, a lot of those trade merchants came, coming from uh, uh, the United States uh, were dealing, you know, to uh, to purchase uh, colonial goods uh, from the colony of Saint-Domingue eh, to, eh, to ship and sell in the United States. A product that was very often purchased from Saint-Domingue by the Americans was molasses. And eh, Le Cai was eh, also a very big producer of molasses at the time. And eh, as a matter of fact, it was one of the best molasses came from, eh, from Le Cai. And uh, so when, it, when somebody in the United States knew that, you know, they were purchasing a okai molasses, uh, they knew it was the best. It was, it was a fine molasses. And therefore, uh, that's where a tidbit information, that's where the word okay comes from in the American language. Something's okay. It comes from it was okay molasses. It was therefore a very good molasses. It was an okay, it was a fine product. And that's where the word okay come from. It's from okay. Very interesting. No, thank you for sharing that information. Really interesting. Uh, another question, uh, how many generations back can DNA be likely to make connections? I can touch on that a little bit. And then Steve, you could jump in <laughs> if you got something. Um, so autosomal DNA um, has the ability to go at least 500 years. So you can reach back, um, I want to say that's eight generations ago. So it's pretty far back. And um, one of my ancestors that I've been able to confirm with DNA that lived um, was, was born around 1750. So that's, that's a really far, far away. So... It, it can go pretty far. And then our last question here actually is directed to you, Andre. Um, how did you come to discover the, the Balan document about the slave Casimir? Oh, um, I, I had found out through um, a descendant of the Balan family that lives in um, the United States, that um, they had made it to the United States and you know, DNA had confirmed all that information of the connection. So I just happened to look in, because um, I knew that they went to South Carolina. So I was like, well, let me look up to see these names in, in information in South Carolina. And I had access to, um, I think it's called Fold3, it's an account um connected with ancestry and um i searched in south carolina and there was this huge list of of slave registries of not slave registries bills bills of sale for these um members of the the family that i descend from and 
they were they were all there and so um that's how I found it and I found so many more and that was a very that was a very shocking sobering thing to find the actual bills of sales for people and their names and the the price that goes along with them and the people who were purchasing them and um yeah that was that was a very that was a very hard thing to to find but yeah that's how I found this particular one well, thank you all for uh, in, in the chat for your very great questions. Um, it is about 7.30 now, so I do just want to wrap it up with a, a couple last announcements. Um, but really, thank you, Elaine, Steve, Peter, Jordan, Natasha, Andre, Jerry, and the rest of the Haitian Genealogy Group. Really a fantastic presentation. Again, very personal. I'm, I'm taking a lot of this in, um, but I know a lot of folks here today are truly appreciative of your willingness to share your research and expertise with, with all of us. Um, so um, my hat's off to all of you. Um, and before we go, I do just want to um, quickly plug one hammock thing that is coming up, and that is our annual gala fundraiser. And I'd love to extend that invitation to you all that is going to be happening virtually again this year on Friday, December 3rd at 7 p.m. And after another year of uncertainties during uh, due to COVID-19 and the current events really affecting our Haitian brothers and sisters in Haiti at the border and here in the States, we are looking forward to an evening of coming together in community. Um, you can find that event page, tickets, and even become a sponsor of the event if you'd like by visiting the museum's website, which is www.hammock.org. And again, please make sure to check out um, Haitian Genealogy on Facebook and their website. I'm personally a part of their group, and there is a lot of great information that's going out daily. So again, a very great resource for everyone here um, tonight. Um, on behalf of the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, again, thank you all. Thank you, the Haitian Genealogy Group and everyone who is able to be here tonight. Um, and I really look forward to bringing you all back. Um, I know there's lots to be asked. There's lots with genealogy. And again, thank you for being here. And I look forward to seeing everyone again at another hammock program here in the new future. Thank you for hosting us, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure.